Okay, I will now call to order this agenda for the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority this Thursday, May 19th at noon. Welcome, everyone. And if you can please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, and Ms. Reese, if you can please do our roll call. Thank you. Chairperson Olivia Diaz. Present. Vice Chairperson William McCurdy. Present. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Present. Commissioner Sharon Davis. Here. Commissioner Michael Disman. Here. Commissioner Tick Siegelblum. Here. Commissioner Dan Shaw. Commissioner Luciana Turner. A quorum is present and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to our second agenda item, public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on this agenda for discussion and possible action. If you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. Uh, we can limit any single speaker um, up to three minutes or extend the time by vote of the board. Is there anyone wishing to give public comment based on the agendized items? Okay. We will have a second public comment period at the end. So we're going to go ahead and close that public comment period and move on to agenda item three, approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes on, of the meeting we held on April 21st, 2022. If there are any corrections for the board, I'll move for approval. Are there any questions or discussions about the motion? Seeing none, I'll take the first from uh, Vice Chair McCurdy. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Black. All of those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to agenda item four, approval of agenda with the inclusion of any emergency items or deletion of any items. Are there any amendments or changes do we, that we need to make, Mr. Jordan, or do we just approve as is? There are no amendments or changes needed today. Thank you. So seeing none, do I have a motion? Move for approval if there are no corrections. I have a first from Vice Chair McCurdy for approval of this agenda. And a second from Commissioner Disman. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll go ahead and move on to section two, consent agenda items number five. Um, so is there, are there any questions or discussion the board wishes to make on the consent agenda items? If there are none, I'll move for approval of consent. Okay, so I have a first second. from Commissioner Black and a second from Vice Chair McCurdy. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That's the end of our consent agenda items. We'll move to section three. This is the commissioner's executive director's recognitions and we'll go to Mr. Jordan for the acknowledgement of our departed or any order you may want to go in, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'd like to offer a moment of silence for the following um, residents and participants who've departed since our last meeting. Uh, Stephen Reese, Wilma, Cor Wilma Corday, Michael Davis, Jacqueline Massaro, Raymond Price Jr., Jr. Niccolo Lavichak, uh, Governor Richardson Jr., Clement Pellegrino, Sheila Wiley, Verna Wilson, Lydia uh, Norgay, Joyce Sorrell, Ronald Moore, Richard Brown, Calvin Burton, and Charles Proutman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Um, we are now on section four of our agenda. These are items that we can 
that we are taking separately from our consent agenda item, the uh, consent agenda we just approved. So um, we're gonna move on to agenda item seven. This is a public hearing and approval of Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority's operating budget for fiscal year ending June 30th, 2023. And our CFO, Fred Heron, will speak to this item. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Fred Heron, uh, Chief Administrative Officer slash CFO. Um, on April the 5th, on April the 5th of 2017, the Senate Governor Affairs Committee required housing authorities, it would introduce the bill, Senate Bill 183, requiring housing authorities uh, to be part of the, the Local Government Finance Act. Uh, I think we had discussion, Commissioner Black and Commissioner McCurdy assist us last year in trying to alleviate that whole issue. Um, but nevertheless, we still required to submit our uh, annual budget uh, from fiscal year uh, June of 23, Fiscal year of June of 2023, um, and we're required to bring it to your board for, to, for approval. Um, attached is a copy, uh, in, your, in your packet, attached was a copy of the operating budget um, for, for the fiscal year 2023. Uh, total revenues $172,591,530. Total expenditures uh, $172,282. Uh, 309 showing a, a total of uh, $309,000 on net income for the year that we're projecting for the fiscal year 23 budget. Uh, as, I state, as, as stated, you know, we're the only housing authority to require to participate in this act. Uh, re real, re Reno and, and rural housing authority uh, were, uh, were not uh, required to submit. Uh, so we want to submit this budget for you guys' approval. Uh, if you have any questions. I will ask my board, do we have any questions for Mr. Heron? We have one from Vice Chair McCurdy. Uh, not a question, more so a comment. Um, are we going to be looking at picking up the, the legislation? Uh, I know our, our chair, we both are, you know, been made aware of the, the, the needed change to, to the Government Affairs Committee and the legislature. Uh, so I would just ask as we approve this, uh, we start, you know, that process early so that we can help, you know, um, get things situated. And it is our. It is, it is it is our uh, um, immediate attention to bring this to our legislators so we can try to get this issue resolved. Thank you. Yeah. And if there are no further questions, I move for approval. All right. Oh, we need to open this to a public hearing first before we do that, Vice Chair. So is there anyone wishing to speak on this agenda item that is here today for public comment? Seeing none, thank you. Mr. Former Past Chair, I uh, will go ahead and um, take the first motion that Vice Chair McCurdy just made. Second. We're going to have a second from Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And we will definitely make sure that we um, take the due time and diligence to uh, gear up for addressing this reporting since we're the only housing agency in the state that has to comply with it. I think that hopefully we can find a sponsor from one of our state legislators to help us not have to do this reporting. That seems like it, it, it almost seems like it's a lot of work for our staff to comply with, but it really doesn't have any significance that I can see. Um, so I, if there's a way for us to move out of that, we want to seek a path forward with the help and support of some legislative colleagues. Duly noted. Thank you. All right, so we'll go to section five, business items, agenda item eight. Let's receive a report from our executive director, Mr. Lewis Jordan, on administrative and operational activities that the agency is currently undertaking and moving along. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to, first of all, um, recognize our um, family self-sufficiency program for receiving the um, Southern Nevada Community Partner of the Year Award. And I also wanted to recognize the chair for being at the event to accept the award. So to the team and, uh, and all of us, this is the award that the agency was, um, that the agency received from, um, from Dress for Success. So thank you. I had a fabulous time with the uh, FSS team, um, Martha Floyd and all the ladies that are caseworkers. They do the 
yeoman's work of helping all of our clients be on a better pathway. So I was honored and humbled to be joining them for an amazing, um, it was an amazing champagne brunch. I can't complain. Um, Very good. And I, I appreciate that was Mother's Day. And I had the fortune of being back at home with my mom. But I appreciate your, your being there in my absence. Because clearly, I would have been there as well. Thank you. And thank you for all the hard work of the team and those of you who had an opportunity to attend as well. I, ha I just have a few other just basic updates before I br we bring up some speakers. Um, HUD is currently reviewing our RFP for project-based vouchers. If the board recalls, we talked about putting a RFP on the street to, um, for project-based vouchers, hopefully getting us partners so that in addition to a lot of the rehabilitation work we've done over the years, we can actually start seeing production of units. So HUD is reviewing that document, and it's just a requirement before we put it officially on the street. So we're anticipating getting a, um, that review document back from HUD uh, within the next few weeks, giving us an opportunity to put it on the street uh, sometimes early June. So when, how many vouchers would we get? We're going to start, well, it's not getting, it's with the project-based voucher program, we can allot up to 20% of our overall um, number, which is around 12,500. And what it will allow us to do is partner with organizations that will create housing. And the traditional voucher moves with the resident as he or she moves or the participant. With project-based voucher, the voucher stays with the unit. So that could be up to 2,000 vouchers that we could partner with Nevada Hand or someone like that? 20% of our total, um, which is what, 2,700, yeah. 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 Now, do we have that many free right now? Well, it comes from our allotment. Okay. And so it's not additional vouchers, but when you look at the availability of, of housing, um, it, it gives the people who are on our wait list and then people who may have a special need based on the project base, it gives them additional options to look for housing. Yeah, and it's an overall part of our strategy, you know, so we anticipate, you know, a, a number of organizations who are saying that, yes, we would like to, to develop more housing, but the, uh, the project based voucher traditionally will allow us to, or the, um, the developer, developer partner, a 10 to 15 year contract with the housing authority. And when they're going to get financing, that's a very powerful tool to have saying that we're working with the federal government through the housing authority who will guarantee these rents up to 15 years. And, um, you know, traditional, again, I mentioned the percentage we have the ability, ability to do. I think as we speak, we have like less than 1% of our vouchers that are project based. So tremendous opportunity for us. And if I can just follow up, and also we were talking about going to D.C. Or, or to our congressional delegation and trying to get more based upon our population. That, that's been an ongoing process, uh, and I'm glad you brought this up, Commissioner. I want to say two weeks ago we had a, a very, very direct and, um, I thought, fruitful call with, um, with D.C., with the Secretary of HUD's office, oh. building that case as to why we need more vouchers and just, you know, as we look at our numbers, um, we, we've seen growth in our region over the last 25 years from 400,000 people to about 2.3 million. We get 12,000, about 12,500 vouchers to serve that population. In comparison, Chicago proper has about 2.6 million people and they get 48,000 vouchers. It's a, it's a formula that just, it's antiquated. I have a it, question. It, 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 yes, Commissioner Craig. About the vouchers. My question is, in some of the meetings I've been in today, uh, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mr. Jordan. Are you finished? No, ma'am. Go ahead. I'm fine. Okay. Uh, it, my understanding, um, in the meetings I was, I was in today, the, uh -huh. a lot of landlords are hesitant about taking the vouchers, even though the vouchers are out there. And my assumption is, I like to think it just may be based upon the location of that area. How well is it, is the community, the business, how well are the business communities accepting the vouchers, uh, the vouchers in, in Vegas? 
You know, the, the, one of the strengths of building a good program is having a strong relationship with the landlord community. And we're building on that relationship right now. Case in point, we've recently set up a, um, a landlord advisory board. Some of our larger landlords, um, folks who are part of the landlord, the landlord association, uh, uh, meet, the landlord association group are sitting on our advisory board, giving us ideas and recommendations on how to enhance and, and attract more landlords. We have incentives that we offer landlords. So to answer your question, you know, we're, we're competing with the open market on, you know, and, and landlords have a choice obviously as to who they rent to. We're trying to make our participants, um, a better choice for landlords using incentives, customer service, and things of that nature. So, um, you know, your what you're hearing at, at the conference is absolutely correct. And we not only do we have the basic Section 8 voucher, we have boutique vouchers. We have vouchers for veterans. We have vouchers for homeless people. And again, at, at the core of those of those. Um, um, engagements, a strong relationship is, is continues to be built from here in the housing authority. Another thing we've done from a customer service standpoint, we've set up a hotline. So when a landlord calls in as participants call in a landlord, landlords now have their dedicated line that goes right to the director's office. And, and it, it's, it's working well for us. You know, we're, um, sometimes within the next 60 days, we're actually going to host our first in a while landlord symposium. We're going to invite existing landlords in, and we're going to invite prospective landlords in. It's been my experience that communication and education are the key to a successful um, relationship with that group. And Mr. Jordan, do we have a date for that landlord symposium? We All do. right, and then I'm, I'm leading into the other thing. Uh, okay, but, uh, there I might know? be a lag, Commissioner Craig, so I'll go ahead and defer to your follow-up and then I'll get to my question. Okay, this is the same thing we have with offenders, uh, ex-offenders or whatever. So are we contemplating about relaxing? I don't know, well, I have my idea about the policies regarding uh, offenders or ex-offenders in order to get to offenders who might have, you know, had challenges. Are we doing things to enable them to uh, be able to get the project-based vouchers uh, based upon loosening some of the rules that we have uh, for people that are ex-offenders? We're working to obviously make the, the entrance into the program as open as possible and utilizing waivers that HUD has made available. Yes, we're taking advantage of any and all waivers that will support bringing people in, but at the same time while maintaining the integrity of the program. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. And the, then just back to my question, yes, do you have that date so we that we can save the date if we can go and we be actually part do. of the conversation? June 23rd, and we'll get a flyer out to the board as well as post things on our website and use other mediums of communications as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Also. And I think, did you have a comment, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair McCurdy? Yes, no, I just think that this is a really good idea. Um, the more uh, project-based vouchers we can get out there, the more opportunities we are to, you know, to bring more housing stock mm -hmm. uh, to be available to our community. And I know that with the relationships that we have between the Housing Authority and you know the, the City of Las Vegas the County, uh, this is going to greatly enhance the tools that we offer to developers as we look to bring more, you know, affordable housing, um, public housing into into the road. So, I, I strongly support it, and I really commend you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. And we have uh, Commissioner Turner. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Um, I was wondering when we mentioned the uh, meeting that's going to be on June 23rd, if someone is not able to appear in person, is there any Zoom or any way you can set up uh, 
Virtual access? Virtual, yes, virtual. If they you know, the pandemic has been a very bad influence and everyone wants a virtual access point. So are we thinking of doing a hybrid model for this meeting? I think there's a number of things that we can consider, which that is one that we can do. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Turner. Good point. Any other comments or questions? I echo. I have another one. <laughs> All right, this is your last one, Ms. Craig, because we got to get the meeting moving. Okay. I know we have some presenters here patiently how waiting. The, how, is the, how are the vendors, how are the contractors, how are people, how receptive are they to the uh, vouchers? Because I understand in some of the meetings, not only are the landlords, but other people are not receptive to it. And I, I, I won't ask any more questions. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner. I could just speak to what we're seeing within our housing consortium as we look to not only bring transitional housing, but also, you know, entry level housing and affordable housing. Uh, this is something that has been asked of us for a very long time. And it's actually um, been very hard to get those out, which is my experience. So this is going to help us be able to to facilitate a better process. And again, it's 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 really desired here. And I can't speak for any other state, but here in, in Southern Nevada and the state of Nevada, it's, it's definitely something that uh, developers are looking to take advantage of because it really just pro provides predictability of a stable source of income that they can expect uh, as they think through uh, developing that project. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Black has a question about the landlord symposium. I was just wondering what, what methods are we using to advertise uh, to really maximize that? benefit that we're providing for the landlords how are we doing outreach to promote participation you know Anita or um, someone on your team wants to speak to that good afternoon chairperson Diaz and commissioners I'm Anita Keys I'm the acting director for the HCV department so to answer your question mr. black we are doing an email blast to all of our um, current landlords and landlords that have participated in the past. We are also we are also going to put something up on our website, and we're going to be posting um, flyers throughout our agency and also our entire department. Thank you, uh, how do you Vice Chair McCurdy. He he made a, a good point. If you have a digital flyer that you can share with the commissioners, maybe we can put it out through our channels, through our boards um, and councils to the landlord you know that way there's just many touch points to get exposure to the event absolutely and also our partnerships with the coc we we meet with the coc at least once every other week so we will be giving them a flyer as well so that they can get that to their um you know people that they deal with commissioner sure how do you reach out to those that currently don't participate in our program so the way we will reach out to the people that don't is we will put it on our on our website but they never look at our website they don't participate in our program <laughs> well we we have we have people that used to participate we'll, we'll do a mailing if you have any suggestions we're open to I'd suggestions suggest, I'd suggest we go to the apartment association oh and absolutely meet, and meet with them and we go to the builders of association and meet with those guys so so we can get the word out to all so, those that currently aren't involved yes sir so so to address that like mr. Lewis has said we meet with um, we have a landlord advisory board. Okay, the library said they're willing to put it out for us, so we'll we'll definitely take advantage of that. I'll, I'll guarantee you the top five apartment builders haven't been in a library in 20 years. Okay, <laughs> we, so, we so have. I'm saying we need we need to broaden our base mm -hmm. because I I know that there are builders who would participate in this, but they they need the information, so we need to get out and meet with those people through the apartment association, through the home builders association, through the realtors, those people. So I'm hearing active. Commissioner Shaw is volunteering to be on the steering committee to engage <laughs> right, right. more well, of this. Well, absolutely. I, 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 wanted I think to. we all could kind of use our leverage. I, I, I see Vice Chair McCurdy nodding and um, past Chair Black saying, absolutely. Uh, we do sometimes engage with folks who are coming through our offices on a regular basis. And I think we could be maybe that facilitator of information, at least, you know, just so letting Su them know. Susie Vasquez, she actually sits on our um, Thank you. I was advisory board. And tell us who Su Su Susie she, Vasquez is. She's over the Apartment Association in Nevada. So she, she'll have a flyer and she can get that out to, you know, 
to all the people that she has, um, that she deals with. So we're, we're trying to get the word out to as many people as possible, but, but we, are at, we will take suggestions. We may even do something with the media. You know, maybe we could do something like that um, or on the radio, whatever, because we, we know without the landlords, our program, we have, in order for our program to be successful, we need our, the partnerships with the landlords. And I wanted to also add that as a part of an additional strategy, going back to the project-based vouchers, um, we're, we're planning on doing a developer conference to help developers understand that, again, we haven't been out forward, out front with this conversation. And that's another medium that we'll use. These symposiums we're looking to do every 30 to 60 days until we get some real traction. But excellent recommendations that yes. we'll, we'll take into consideration. Absolutely. And Commissioner Turner? Um, excuse me, as an added um, maybe feature or bonus, we have a lot of hotels. And I think that um, they house most of the people that are probably on housing. I mean, they employ a lot of the people and their employees are suffering because they have lack of housing, don't have enough money, you know. So I think that they should also buy into uh, affordable housing projects. So I think that would be also a great way to, to look at people that could possibly develop um, housing for not just the you know citizens here, but also their employees. Thank you. Anita, before you sit down, or any other questions on this item? I have a Come comment I want to make. Um, now, I'm not necessarily volunteering for a, <laughs> <laughs> a committee, but I want to tell you, uh, I'm a disabled veteran, and uh, I think that uh, exposure to the veteran system would be very significant because there's so many veterans that are looking desperately for places, and the system will Will, will help you in any way possible to promote it, advertise it, whatever. So I just want, to, want you to put that definitely in your direction in terms of where you're going. Absolutely. What, what, what is our voucher count for uh, VASH and how are we doing? We have about 1,400 uh, vouchers uh, designated just for the VASH population. And I believe we're leased up around 1,200. And that's, for, that's specifically for Just veterans. specifically for VASH. Of which the veterans don't know about. No, we work very so closely with work, the VA administration. Because I haven't seen, you know, I constantly, I guess because I'm so ill all the time, I'm constantly going out to the, um, to the main hospital where they have all the, the benefits and so forth and all the paperwork. I've never seen anything related to it. So uh, we, perhaps uh, some of us can pinpoint that a little better, that uh, they do make that more accessible to veterans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Hi, I'm Angela Yenchuk. I'm the acting deputy director for HCV. Um, I did just sit on a meeting with the VA all day yesterday. We do work very closely with them, and they have requested to join our advisory board. So they will be joining Excellent. that. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Because so the need is definitely there. Yes, mm -hmm. and we did work with the technical assistance team yesterday mm -hmm. to um, speed the program along, basically help more veterans. So yeah, we're all we just started working on that process. So. Excellent, thank okay. you. <laughs> yes. Okay. So as you guys know, um, each housing authority across the country were awarded a certain amount of emergency housing vouchers. Our jurisdiction uh, were offered 586. Now you had the, the each housing authority had the option to either take what they were offered or they could refuse them. We took our 586. Um, and so to some of our successes, we are now leased up at 253. We're at, that's about 43%. The national average for the lease up for that particular um, group is around 30%. So we're doing a lot better than the national average. We started off kind of slow. Um, I would say the first couple of months, we only leased up maybe 75 of our um, emergency housing vouchers. But since the onset of Mr. Lewis and Mr. Lewis instilling in us how important it is to um, partner with um, the community, and we, we've met with COC you know, every week, we've doubled that just since the mm -hmm. onset of Mr. Lewis. So, and we're doing better than the national average. As a result, 
of our success, HUD has asked us, and we're only one of four housing authorities across the country, they've asked us to get together with their TAC group and they're gonna feature us on their website. So that's, that's to come. Yeah. That's to come. So we're doing, we're doing ooh, very ooh, good. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, and we're, we're excited. We're, we, we think that we're, well, we know because the words of Mr. Lewis, failure is not an option. We know that we're gonna do our 586 and we're gonna ask for more. So what happens there is that's where we need you guys because we have to have the stock in order to lease these people up. We can give them the vouchers. Oh, as a matter of fact, all 586 of our vouchers are issues. Mm -hmm. So we've leased up 253 that have found housing. The other ones are out there looking. So we have, we've, we've utilized all of our vouchers and some of them are still out there looking. So that's where we need you, know, you guys because we have to have the, the inventory in order for the, the um, people to be able to find somewhere to live. So we're doing a, we're doing a great job there. I'd like to make a comment um, as somebody running for office, anything we can do like this to publicize it? Because all we hear all day is how the homeless or whatever, we're not doing anything to address it. And the fact is we're doing this and we're, it's, it's fantastic. Yes, we are. And thank you, Mr. Lewis, for doing that. Yes. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for all thank your you. awesome work. Thank you. And your reports to us. Thank you. Great job, team. Um, just a couple other things I wanted to highlight. Um, this, as a staff, we were successful in meeting the deadline for the uh, Homies Nevada applications. This is where the governor has offered up to $500 million to um, maintain and in increase affordable housing in our state. And uh, we got our pre-applications in. Uh, we sought suggestion and help for every opportunity to enhance what we do. Uh, we're waiting to hear back, you know, from the the um, the governor's office as to what those awards will look like. But it was very important for me to report to you that we got it in and got it in on time. So, and just kind of thank the well staff. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, we've gotten off to a really good start with our CNI. If you all remember Choice Neighborhood Initiative, this is where um, our housing authority was awarded up to $700,000 in grant from HUD for planning um, on a community revitalization process. And it's also always important to know 3,200 housing authorities around the country, 32 applied, only eight received. We were one of eight. If we work with this process correctly and, and really show the synergy within the community, in two years we'll be eligible for up to $50 million in an implementation grant. One of the first steps to this process, and rightfully so, is working with our resident population in a survey. And over the last few weeks in conjunction, and I want to be very clear, working with the city of Las Vegas, the resident council and staff, we've really, really gotten off to a very strong start with the survey. So I just wanted to recognize the team. And I wanted to yield a few moments at this time to our president of the resident council uh, at Marble Manor, uh, Madeline Rose, who had a couple things that she wanted to say. Welcome, Ms. Rose. Hello, Madeline Rose, Marble Manor, 914 McWilliams Avenue. Um, well, as executive director was just saying, we had we are off to a good start in communication and relationship bonding and building to some degree. So um, I thank you so much for everything that the staff, the housing authority has done and come and pulled through and shown up. And that's been very important in showing up. And so um, as well as there was a beautiful turnout for the Mother's Day um, event and they came, it was just beautiful. It was housing people everywhere, you know, and I'm just, it was just beautiful. And then a lot of residents, a lot of fun and all the way. But we wanted to make sure that we did give the commissioner mothers um, some accolades and Mother Day gifts. And we thank you guys so much, so much for your service um, as well as thank you so much, Chairperson. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much for you all service and your, for your work. We well, thank very you. much appreciate it. Um, we also are extending um, you guys to come and attend the different things that's happening. Um, as of the sixth of sixth of excuse me, the second of June, 
uh, McCurdy, matter of fact, <laughs> will be coming out there. And excuse me, you're not. I'm not McCurdy, not you, <laughs> Commissioner McCurdy, but Mr. Chase McCurdy will be coming out doing art with the community and the elders and the youth in the community. So I know we talked about that briefly. You all were coming out, and so we're doing that on the 6th. We're doing Poetry Promise on the 28th, um, 25th. And then, so there's other things that are starting getting ready to turn out that we would just like to make sure that you all are, show your head, you know, pop your face in and get engaged with some of these things. And, and as we are building and having conversations about what they would like to do in participation within the CNI, within the community, what skill sets they have to bring in value to the community so that we can identify those who have skills that can be part of this process and intertwined in this whole process. So again, thank you guys so much and I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, actually, um, Vice Chair McCurdy was just leaning in saying and how important it is to partner with Workforce Connections, but I think you have an update to share along those lines too, Mr. Jordan. Absolutely. Okay, so. Very good. And I, and two, I just wanted to add for the commissioners that our team will continue to work with the resident council to make sure that we coordinate calendars. You know, there's, there's a lot that we all have going on and, and I think you would all say everything is as important as everything else but having things on the calendars are key. And so we'll work with the council to make sure that your support teams, all of you get the proper notice so that we can continue to show support. Very good. A um, Couple other things that I wanted to have, you know, uh, a few folks come up and speak. I wanted to acknowledge again, the efforts that the team put together to have the mobile onsite eye care van um, that actually showed up at Archie Grant yesterday um, that's at Wardell today. This is a another collaboration where a uh, eye care van comes out, does um, um, testing or eye exams, glass uh, subscriptions, checking for diabetes. You know, again, all of those things that are beyond just halls and walls, beyond the physical structures are what we do but speak to the people side and so again we that's just one partner that we have um, one additional partner we have that comes out to support our efforts and again this um the mobile van was at archie grant yesterday uh very well received by the residents there next stop is wardell and um and again we'll continue to do these things so that you know we can make sure that everyone understands that we're just not providing housing, we're providing services. Very good. Um, I'd like to briefly have Gila Bronner from the Bronner Group come up. If you all recall, last month you approved the contract for us to do a, um, uh, an, an assessment of, um, of the organization to come up with best practices and really position us to, to be much more effective and Ms. Bronner from the Bronner Group will come up and just give a brief overview of the process that they're undertaking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Gila Bronner. I am president and CEO of the Bronner Group. And with me is my colleague, Mr. Mark Plummer, a government services executive with Bronner. Um, I'm here, I'd like to thank the board and the authority for engaging the Bronner Group to conduct an analysis and assessment really focused on strategically optimizing both the organizational and operating framework of the authority. Bronner's work will be conducted over the next four months, culminating with both a formal report and a recommended action plan, tactical and actionable action plan for the authority's consideration. Over the last few days, Mr. Plummer and I have had the opportunity to kick off the project and conduct a series of preliminary interviews, as well as initiate our data gathering phase. We look forward to continuing our project work and engaging with the board and authority personnel and would be uh, happy to entertain any questions. Uh, and if not, we look forward to- Commissioners, do you have you. any questions for the 
Okay, Commissioner Sagerbloom. Yes, so uh, could you just briefly summarize what you would hope to provide us when you're done? Yes, <coughs> so we will be looking at all the business functions within the organization, developing, uh, con conducting best practice and benchmarking analysis, and developing recommendations as part of that where they would be appropriate for enhancing the operating framework, the accountability framework, internal controls, and ensuring as we look at service <coughs> delivery structures and organizational capacity, what we can do to enhance that so to better support achievement of the authority's mission. Sounds like a lot of work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, but we're efficient. We've already, uh, we've already conducted a, a quite a few interviews back to back over the last couple of days with senior executive staff, and we're looking forward to continuing that outreach throughout the organization. <coughs> And I wanted to add that within the engagement, there'll be an opportunity for you all also to speak with the Bronner Group as it relates to, you know, policy and, 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 and vision that you have, you know, as board members. So we'll, we'll create that opportunity, <coughs> as mentioned earlier, probably virtually, mm -hmm. but, uh, but at the same time, it's so important that you are part of this, this process as well. Commissioner Shaw? Uh, first of all, I want to apologize that I wasn't at the last meeting. I had a family issue, but and so I didn't get to ask my standard consultant questions. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming that in our interview process, that any conflicts of interest have been disclosed. Yes. So if you have a favorite software that we don't know about, that won't be the one that will get recommended, or so we're on a level playing field all the way across the board? Absolutely, um, certainly, well, we don't recommend software. Okay. <laughs> we would be, uh, um, all of our recommendations will be focused on specifically uh, putting in place, whether it's policies, procedures, uh, internal controls, revising structures, so they will all be what I would consider to be actionable um, immediately actionable uh, recommendations that hopefully will not even require resources. Okay, and this one's going to be a full disclosure question. Sure. So I'm going to tell you that I've developed in Chicago, in Brownsville, in Milwaukee, and Mr. Plummer, Three I see. Three of my clients. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so question number one is, did they implement your recommendations? Um, yes. Uh, in fact, we just completed a second round of working with Brownsville from a strategic planning perspective. Milwaukee, we have continued to support Milwaukee for the last several years in a number of areas, most recently developing a business continuity plan and organizational resiliency plan coming out at, actually throughout the pandemic and working with them. Okay, uh, and I, I will say that Brownsville's improved. Talk to me about Chicago. <laughs> because in my opinion, that's been an uphill battle for a long, long time. Um, I, I will say we've had the privilege and pleasure of working with over 70 public housing authorities, starting with the original HUD takeover of the Chicago Housing Authority in 1995. So uh, I think it has come a long way, and I think public housing in general has okay. really focused on leveraging best practices from the private sector, as well as other aspects of government to continue to enhance their operating framework. And explain to me on the implementation side, you provide us a report with recommendations and how to implement it. And does, is part, I apologize, but as part no, of your okay. contract that you follow up with that to see how we're doing on implementation? Um, and if the we, opportunity is there for you to continue to engage us. Okay, so that's an additional cost. That, that is from an implementation perspective. And I think once you look at the plan, we will have to ring prioritize for you, look at the level of effort for the authority that would be required to implement it. Um, we stand ready to assist in, in any and all uh, any and all implementation activities that would be associated with any of the recommendations. And do you interview outside of the authority? Yes, in terms of key stakeholders. Okay, so um, you're going to talk to... And we will be developing that list in collaboration. You're going to talk to other management companies that manage and, and We would so speak forth. to a representative. Obviously, there's a specific scope, engagement, right. and hours by task. So we will be, we will make sure that it is an inclusive process. Okay. for all key stakeholders, residents, landlords, developers, whoever would be impacting 
on the nature of the analysis and the assessment areas across the organization. And how do you handle, for want of a better term, change orders? So you dive into this and say, look, we know you've got greater needs than what our scope outlined in this area. How do you present that to us? How do you go about pricing that? Um, uh, I, would, I would say, depending on the nature of it, we, um, typically what we would do is we would develop a proposed, uh, proposed task amendment to the contract with very specific hours and tasks that would be associated with so it. So it's based on an hourly basis? Um, it's an hourly basis, but for the most part, it, I mean, not time and materials. I mean, it's a, it's a set amount of hours for very specific tasks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Turner. Yes, thank you. Um, hearing that um, you said part of the strategic planning, and am I right to assume, um, Director, that this information will also be beneficial to us when we start the, um, the other part of the planning for the CNI grants and for the Choice Neighborhood voucher, I mean, you know, the Choice Neighborhood um, that we expect to get, and hopefully in the next couple of years, will this information that we're using help us to move forward or will we have to do this process again? Yes, it will help us. And I think more importantly, or equally as importantly to Commissioner Shaw's questions, the, and, and clearly understand where you're coming from, having worked with consultants over the years, the the responsibility starts and stops right here. I just want to be on record. You know, the fact that we're I using have, tax. I have, I, have a, I have a famous quote about consultants. Okay. You engage them to, to do a complete analysis and let you know what time it is. They work on it for six months and then they come in your office and they ask you, well, what time is it? And they repeat back to you what you told them. So, so I'm, 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 I'm yeah, not denigrating the industry at all. I'm just saying that a lot of times we understand what our issues are, but it's helpful, I think, to have an outside group tell you what your issues are. Because we may say to ourselves, well, gosh, yeah, we knew we had a problem here. So you're not telling us anything new. But at least it gives us a highlight that says, yeah, well, you need to do this and this and this to change it. Um, I would like to add, I'm also a CPA and an auditor, so I'm very focused on demonstrating stewardship and accountability. Okay. And, and given the, the level of interaction within the engagement, the reporting, the, the um, best practices, I, I, would, I, I would expect what I get and the team gets will give us an opportunity to enhance. And from a board's perspective, making sure that there's transparency to position you to say, Lewis, this was a best practice. This is a recommendation. What are you doing with it? So again, the, the accountability after the suggestions are given um, starts and starts, starts and stops right here. Thank you. Um, and if I may, just one, one last comment. I, and I, I've mentioned this, I had the opportunity to briefly uh, meet the, the chairperson and vice chair. I think this is a particularly unique time in our history. And I think between the Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Act, and all of the other wonderful funding opportunities that are out there, that this is the right time to look at how to really shore up and optimize the organization to be able to both um, work intergovernmentally, intragovernmentally, and collaboratively across state and local government. And I think the housing authority, being a regional housing authority, is so well positioned for that. So I, I, we appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your time. Thank you to the broader group for being here. Um, I just think the board is hungry for actionable items sure. and for us to start putting the pedal to the metal because we've approved yep, many contractors and we're ready to do the work, roll up our sleeves and just get in there and do the work. So Absolutely. I think that's yeah. why this board is so unique. We all care. We're all passionate about this space and we want to continue the momentum forward. So thank you so much. So, and we look forward to working with you on that journey. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair McCurdy. I'm just going to leave it alone and say ditto. Uh, we're ready to get to work, but uh, more importantly, uh, we hired our executive director to do a job. Um, he brought us um, a game plan, and I trust in the game plan, and we have to just trust the process that we will be successful. Uh, the timing is right. 
We are a regional board. We have every jurisdiction accounted for here on this board. And ultimately, uh, he is responsible and responsive to us. So we're going to make sure that, you know, we do this right. And we're looking forward to that game plan. And I will reiterate uh, that I'm looking for the branding of the plan so that we can exactly. do that media work to let folks know that we're on the right track. So thank you for present presenting. All righty. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, perfect segue into the end of my report. Um, it, it's so important that I think we constantly acknowledge building strong community is just not about housing. It's about partners, it's about collaboration, um, and, and it's about our efforts to make sure that we're providing the best opportunities and resources for those we serve to help them move from where they are to where they like to be. Um, I like for Tracy Torrance to come up and introduce our two speakers who will speak to the significant partnerships and collaborations we've developed so that we can provide better services to our tenants. Tracy. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I'm Tracy Torrance, Supportive Services Manager. Uh, I will introduce them one at a time. Um, the first person that I'd like to introduce and bring up is Ms. Deborah Salt. She is a longtime partner of the Housing Authority and Supportive Services. She is the Director of Workforce Training and Economic Development for Vegas PBS. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Salt. Great, and thanks for having me, um, Chair, um, Commissioners, and again, it, this was my first opportunity to meet our uh, new director. And um, I have been a uh, party to, or partner, I should say, with the Housing Authority, not only in my personal business when I was a training consultant, but now at Vegas PBS. And Tracy's team has done a great job of bringing back um, the partner, the community partner group, um, for those people who are providing services to the residents. And so we're really happy to meet with them on a, at least, I think it's every other month. Uh, basis where we talk about the programs and services that we're able to bring to the table. So I'd like to do a short presentation about the, the program that we have at Vegas PBS because most people think of Vegas PBS as the programming. Um, so, oops, okay, it wasn't at the beginning. So. Most of you know us for the different programs that we serve. A lot of people know us for our children's programming, or you have your favorite show, uh, the PBS NewsHour, Downton Abbey, Sesame Street, Outdoor Nevada. So um, few of us know all the different services that Vegas PBS provides to our community. So what I, my goal today is to kind of, it's like an iceberg, is to tell you about what's the bottom layer of what we do going beyond the broadcast and bringing these services into the homes of our residents, but also as a service provider to the community. Education is at the core of the services, and some people say, why workforce training at a public media station? We are the number one um, station when it comes to workforce training here in of all the PBS stations in America. So other PBS stations are trying to do what we do, um, and it's, it's really exciting. About ten, well, during the last recession is when we started the workforce training department, and it was uh, Tom Axtell at the time was the general manager, and his he said, I can either do a television show and show people how to go to work, but the greatest need was to retrain people in order to train them for the new jobs and the new economy that was emerging from that. So we started our workforce training department. During COVID, I will tell you, it, we expanded. Um, we do not compete with the colleges. We partner with the colleges. We don't do what the college does. But now we're looking at credit for prior learning. Um, how do we give people a good career ladder or lattice within their organization? We work directly with business and industry in order to talk about what are some of the needs. What are the emerging needs? Today, I was talking to North Las Vegas on their testing needs. Um, so we're always engaged and then sharing that information with the rest of the partners. One of the things about what we do, everything we do is online. 
online is not for everyone. And I'm going to tell you that some people used to think it was less than. It's actually more than. It's harder to do an online because you have to have great skills. And when I say great skills, you have to be organized. You have to be dedicated. You have to want to learn that way. And again, it's not for everyone. I get a lot of referrals into my office. I tell as many people know we're not the right program for you as we tell them, yes, this is a great program for you. Um, we have a philosophy of high tech, high touch, which make us, makes us very unique in the workforce market. We're not case managers. I'm not hiring social workers, but I certainly work with all of the case managers within the workforce system. Um, it's an kind of a philosophy also of anytime, anywhere learning um, and any, any media now, um, whether it's television, whether you want to do it on your cell phone, whether you want to do it on a laptop um, or on your TV if you've got internet capability. We train everything from the person who needs to get uh, trained for additional tr um, certifications or retraining to retest. But we also, so the professional all the way to the beginner, including My Time English, which is an ESL program. Yes, we have a lot of ESL programs that are free in the community. What's different in the students that we see is they are always starting over. Um, if they have to go to work, they drop out of different programs. So with ours, it's anytime some people say, well, what if um, the family gets all the language and my attitude is great share it with the whole family if you're enrolled in our programs because we want our people to be fluent and participate in the public entity i have a quick question about the ell classes and does it is it applicable to their workforce setting what they're learning or is it For just ELL? A, mm -hmm. our ell program that we have is called my time english and My Time English was developed by National Geographic. It trains them and start, it actually has an assessment piece in it that will put them in the right level. So if they know nothing about English, then they start in level one. There's over, over 200 and some odd activities in any one of the programs. They actually are using it with what's called voice activation technology. So they have a headphone, they're speaking, the computer actually diagnoses them. Um, they are learning reading, writing, and speaking, and then they can test out at the end. If they cannot test out, it puts them back into the same level that they are and then does not give them the same lessons. It gives them a new set of lessons because memorization is not effective in the workplace, but it does teach them the reading, writing, and speaking. Over the course of the year, they have a year's access to the program. They can test out up to a level four which actually prepares them to sit for college for the TESOL exam. So it's very different. It's very exciting. I've had people that come into my office and do not know a lick of Spanish or a lick of English. I have Spanish interpreters that are part of my staff. They're the ones who interpret for them. Uh, about three weeks later, I had one gal call me and I'm on the phone with her and I looked down and it was her name on my phone and I said, is this my Maria? Um, because again, we're in touch with them on a regular basis. She could speak to me over the phone and prior, three weeks prior, she could not speak to me. Um, one of the things, and when I say it's high tech, high touch also, is because oftentimes in the, in the home, they're not practicing the English. So oftentimes the husband or the wife will come in for the person who's actually being enrolled. And one of the things, they kind of get my lecture. And I say, okay, there's no more English in the, or no more Spanish in the home. You need to speak to each other in English because practice is what they need. And uh, they kind of look at me, but it, it's made a difference. And our students, right now we have um, our uh, completion rates with all of our students across all of our programs is over 94% start a program and complete their program, which are pretty good stats. Uh, and again, we have everything from My Time English, um, high school completion programs, certify for medical, they can certify, they can do robotics, they can do um, electrician, they can do um, manufacturing. So again, my goal is that we wanna give them something that is going to give them a living wage that they will be able to complete within the, the time frame that the workforce system actually allows. We are on the approved training provider um, programs with all of the, our workforce programs. 
Um, we also have OSHA certifications and we have employers that will hire and that we refer them to. We also do high stakes testing um, at Vegas PBS. So whether or not they need to get their high school diploma or if they need typing tests, if they need Excel certifications, uh, we also do um, elevator certifications with the state of Nevada. Um, again, our testing center is open Monday through Saturday. Um, but we do tip as Saturday is all teacher testing um, because of the lack of teachers in our classrooms. Um, there's a whole list, so I'll leave this with you. What is the future? Well, one of the things that we do is we're constantly investigating what are, where the industry is emerging, who are the employers that are moving in. We've got meetings with Amazon because of the new mandate from the governor that says everybody's going to need coding. We have all the AWIS coding classes now. We have, have 10 different options. And so we'll be working with all the different partners also and in order to look at how we implement that in our community. And again, we share those opportunities. Joptimize is another um, assessment that we brought in. We brought that, this in just prior to COVID. It's a behavioral assessment that measures 25 different behaviors and then matches the candidate with jobs that they're suited to do, not jobs that we say that everybody, we've got all these openings. With this assessment and because of our the ARPA funds, we got a City of Las Vegas grant. We will be working with all of the partners in order to make it free for our um, community citizens to be able to look at that and match them to training programs that they're suited to do, that there's jobs to do, and, um, and that we have employers ready, willing, and able to um, hire them. So it's a unique assessment. Again, most um, people assess and, and look at your skill, but here we're looking at fit and right fit for the individual. Um, our quality programming, again, we try and extend the life of any of the programs that we have. It's just in time. Um, online career training programs and services, high stakes testing, job to mize, business to business outreach, community awareness, and again, we want you to be the spokesperson for us as well or come to us with solutions. So, thank you. Thank you. I know I only had four minutes. Do we, are there any questions? Perfect timing. Um, I just want to let everyone know that Commissioner Turner and I are going to be more educated in the housing space. Um, we're <laughs> heading out to a conference, but we're going to leave you in good hands with Vice Chair McCurdy. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, your presentation is a perfect segue into the next presenter, um, particularly when it comes to new technology and digital learning. And I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Kelvin Watson, who is the executive director of the Las Vegas Clark County Library. And they're doing new and great things. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chairperson McCurdy, uh, commissioners, executive director Jordan, staff, and guest. So since I'm going to stick to my word, I'm going to stick to my minutes of my words so I can stay on track. So it was definitely a good segue to learn more about what Vegas PBS is doing. And I look forward to actually partnering with them uh, as well. So again, I'm Kelvin Watson, executive director for the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. It's my honor to join you today and take this opportunity to share with you some of the great things that we're doing at the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, serving all of Southern Nevada through our 25 branches, which span 8,000 square miles, some of the unique programming that we have and have been implementing. And actually the library, um, to Commissioner Shaw's comment, uh, I wanted to make sure that I share that during fiscal 20 to 21, uh, during the pandemic that we actually had over 3.1 million visits to our physical branches. So people are still coming to the library. Um, I also want to start off by sharing my deep belief and knowing that libraries are powerful places. We've offered vaccine and health testing clinics, computers to apply for jobs, access to job training and career services, and resources also to help small businesses. We are places that support education for all ages, but especially our children through homework help and tutoring both online and in person. 
Last weekend, we launched our Summer uh, Challenge, which is our summer reading and activities program for children and youth through birth, from birth through uh, 12th grade. And this year, we've added an adult component, so really making Summer Challenge a family-oriented program. We offer hundreds of programs throughout the year that demonstrate for all that learning is not only essential, but can also be fun. Libraries also enrich our lives through cultural experiences, uh, and we are fortunate that the library district to have our theaters and performance spaces, making it possible to offer hundreds of free live performances, music, dance, theater, comedy, and we even have magic shows as well. We also have 15 art galleries, which um, consistently win Best of Las Vegas uh, recognition for best art exhibitions, um, and we provide endless opportunities for free entertainment at home through streaming and downloading of digital books, movies, and music. So I'm proud today to share with you uh, of just a few things that the library district is doing as a focus of our strategic playbook with 2026, which we implemented last July, which is forged and we continue to forge partnerships, powerful partnerships to create innovative programming and provide equity and access to all. So I'm gonna talk about a few things. Uh, again, if I talk about everything the library district is doing, and I know lots of commissioners know about what we're, what we're doing um, through the library, but some of you um, actually have heard this, some of this before, uh, Commissioner Siegerblum and Commissioner McCurdy, uh, that what we've been up to. So last fall, we partnered with the RTC on a program that enables bus riders to gain instant access to our online digital resources using free onboard Wi-Fi on more than 400 of the transit buses. Many of these riders and their children may have never set foot in a library before, and now they are discovering materials and services for the first time. Since the program launched, the library district has welcomed and added over 8,000 new bus riders to our library system with library cards and access. This program has received national recognition from three library trade organizations for its innovation, including the Library of the Future Award from the American Library Association. On April 24th of this year, the library district launched a groundbreaking new program to help bridge the digital divide for some of our community's most vulnerable. We launched this innovative program with the Nevada Homeless Alliance, the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth, and T-Mobile to lend more than 300 of these cell phones to low-income and homeless residents, providing pre-loaded phones with library apps for education and employment support and resources for social services and critical health support. The program was funded with a $200,000 grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Nevada State Library. Actually, we uh, recently heard after we launched this program through one of the recipients, they actually got home, they actually got housing within two weeks. Through these cell phones, we are not only providing a phone, but we're providing a lifeline. We're providing 18 months of service, which includes 5G and unlimited minutes and unlimited data. The Clark County School District is another vital partner of the library district, and we're involved in several programs with our schools across the county, serving our 320,000 CCSD students to access the library district's online library services through their district portal. So this also includes Boulder City, North, North Las Vegas, and the Henderson Library as well. So the Las Vegas Clark County Library District is funding and supporting this initiative for the entire county. Accelerating early childhood learning is one of the Las Vegas Clark County Library District's most urgent priorities. To help boost these critical, critical skills, the Library District used additional grant funds to purchase more than 1,000 tablets that are preloaded with educational apps and videos, storybooks, and games for kids uh, up to age eight. The tablets are 100% secure. Importantly, we got it. 
Importantly, they do not require any internet connection. This allows families that cannot afford Wi-Fi to still give their children the opportunity to develop literacy uh, skills. The tablets are free to check out from all of our 25 library locations. Mastering digital skills is also critically important for teens to help them enter the job market. So we've been working to expand our teen tech initiatives through programs such as the Best Buy Teen Tech Center, the Cox Steam Lab, the Robot Lab powered by Switch, and in Nevada Energy EL28 lab. These teen tech labs create hands-on technology training in a fun, relaxed environment. Teens receive education and tutoring with local university students to build their confidence and help them envision a future where college may not be attainable. Another new library district initiative that we're implementing is funded by the Supporting and Advancing Nevada's Dislocated Individuals Grant a partnership with the Nevada Governor's Office of Workforce Innovation and Nevada State Library. The program is designed to help individuals reimagine their career paths by gaining marketable skills in such resilient STEM industries as healthcare, logistics, IT, advanced manufacturing, and the construction trades through virtual reality and 3D training. We actually started delivering those, those uh, 3D goggles at our West uh, Charleston Library yesterday. Following the lifting of Nevada's eviction ban in May of 2021, the Las Vegas Clark County Library District partnered with the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada to hold pop-up clinics inside our branches to help tenants learn their rights and respond to ev eviction notices, providing access to free, trustworthy legal services, certainly as a lifeline for many Southern Nevadans. And we are continuing to explore ways that we can work further with the Legal Aid Center. And on June 4th, we're partnering with the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority to help distribute 300 Chromebooks that we received, the library district received, as part of the emergency connectivity funding for library patrons who do not otherwise have access to equipment or services sufficient to meet their educational needs. The library patron recipients are being identified by SNRHA this distribution is a part of a larger uh, Family Day event at the Walnut Recreation Center. And LVCCLD will also be promoting our other library services, our STEAM activities. We'll be signing customers up for library cards, uh, et cetera, full, full day of events. No, that was which no, you weren't done yet, please. <laughs> The, the clapping was to acknowledge, the clapping was to acknowledge. I was done. I was like, hey, no. they, they, please, they please continue. Off, pulling me off the stage. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually done. So thank you again for allowing me to share these innovative new programs. There's so many more things that are happening at the library with the library district. I'm extremely proud of the library district team members, um, you know, who are continually finding new ways to partner, inspire, educate, uplift, and entertain the diverse residents of Clark County. And again, if you do not have your library card yet, I encourage you to get carded, hashtag get carded, by stopping by your neighborhood branch or visiting our website at lvccld.org. Thank you so much. And on, on behalf of the staff and all those we serve, we appreciate your leadership and the partnership. Thank you so much, Commissioner. That's pretty exciting. Uh, I think it's gonna be um, a tremendous asset to our communities that we represent. And again, thank you for all the work that you are doing within the library and we appreciate your leadership. It has been um, very noticeable, uh, all the changes that have been made and all the uh, improvements that are happening within our community. So thank you again and, and thank you, Tracy, for, for the in kind introduction. Uh, with that being said, um, we are at the second part of citizens' participation. Uh, if there is anyone uh, either here or on the phone who would like to um, come forward for public comment, uh, this is now your time. You will be allotted, uh, I believe it's three minutes, uh, that, we're, that we're asking for you to stay within. Uh, but this is the time for you to talk about items that are not on the agenda. Um, and we ask that you come forward now.
and please state your name for the record and if you are within one of the properties please share with us which property you're at welcome and thank you for joining us My name, excuse me, I'm going to read to stay on task. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Mitchell, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Mary A. Mitchell, date of birth 217-1949, previous address 6221 Anaconda Ave 89108. Mary is 73 years old, disabled, and requires a 24-hour living caregiver. Mary has had her voucher, her housing choice voucher, since 1994 for 28 years. In those 28 years, Mary has lived in two homes, first one in Seattle for 20 years. Then she and her late husband, Stephen Mitchell, of 47 years, transferred her voucher to their second home in Las Vegas, where they lived eight years. She is now, for the first time in her 73 years of life, homeless with her caregiver since August 2021. Not from her doing, but due to the negligence and incompetence of Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority case managers. And we all have documentation to support everything I'm about to state, including certified letters, receipts, emails, and so on. January 28th of 2021, Mary received a call from a Mara West property management staff, <coughs> staff asking, has she moved yet? Mary was shocked, stated she never put in a tent to move from the house. And they stated that Ms. Kinsley, caseworker, had contacted their office and told them verbally that Mary would be moving from the residence. Mary was confused, told them she did not want to move, and this was a big mix mistake. They informed her to call housing. And as Mary started looking at some recent paperwork, she noticed that the housing had mixed her up with another client who was moving out of her home named Mary A. Mitchell, date of birth 1977. By the time this error was recognized, it was too late. A Mary West wanted Mary to vacate. They had already begun the process of getting a new tenant. Mary contacted <clears throat> housing for help. Kinsley simply stated it was a mistake and requested she immediately send that paperwork back and, or, dest or destroy it or burn it. Mary asked for Kinsley for help as she had received a formal vacate notice and Kinsley told her to go to Nevada Legal Services. This has led to Mary being in court over eight times physically fighting vacate notices during a pandemic, requesting extensions for her stay in her home legally. During this process of this mistake, we continue to ask for help from the Housing Authority in 2021 from Kinsley, her case manager, Destiny Corbez, D. Watson, M. Watson, Gresley Williams, via email, via certified letters, to no avail. This led to us writing a letter, a formal complaint on April 2nd. No response, no hearing. Filed another complaint on Destiny. Even after that complaint, she continues to headline Mary A. Mitchell's case. <clears throat> to no avail, which means that it has not been addressed or simply ignored. Mary has been a victim of intimidating statements and conduct by Ms. Corpez, suggesting if you don't like the program, get off of it. Sorry, you don't remember. And she's acknowledged these, some of these emails that she's seen, and she states no one is responding, and this is via email, because you are not on foul as her POA, meaning me, although it was clearly stated that the email was being written on behalf of Mary and pleased to call Mary on her phone number. Still, <clears throat> no call, no special, no special accommodations. Asked us to come into the lobby to get extension forms because Mary's housing choice voucher had expired August 2021. They had restated it. They had canceled her voucher. They reinstated it for another four months. Since then, we've had to file extensions every 30 days, which is a challenge. Destiny sends expired paperwork by the housing with a timestamp on the envelope, often two or three days after the paperwork inside was set to expire. She is currently, Mary Mitchell is currently on her final extension for her voucher. She stands to lose it. This has caused Mary mental, emotional, financial distress, victim of not only excessive application fees of $100 per application, and she has fixed income, Social Security, is, is caused detrimental effects on her credit. Her credits went from 800 to 580, and she's been the victim of what appears to be an employee cover-up, double standards, rejection, failure to provide fair housing for her disability, no special accommodations, failure to provide adequate resources, lack of communication, neglect, and intimidation. Thank you for your time. I just want to thank you for coming forward today. Um, thank you for your advocacy on behalf of Ms. Mitchell. I would ask that you um, hang, hang around after the meeting. Someone will be right over to you immediately to have a conversation with you. Um, 
we are not going to go back and forth because we are in public comment, but we want to thank you for coming forward. We thank hear you. you. We hear thank you. you. I thank you, Chamber. Thank, thank you, thank Mr. You. Jordan. All right. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Tony Mams. I am with IME Patient Advocacy Program. I am here to discuss the letter that was mailed from the city of Las Vegas in regards to selling the houses in, in the ESP program. I've received many calls from many I'm clients. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're going to hang around, correct? Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank All right. I received many calls from many clients um, requesting what's going on. These houses were purchased with a grant, and part of the contract was to rent these homes to qualifying individuals for a certain period of time. Why were they allowed to break this agreement? Why is the city allowed to profit from the sale of these homes that they invested, fun that they invested no funds in, thus creating potential homelessness for the clients that live in them? How long has the Housing Authority known about this, and why did they not reach out to make us aware of many families potentially becoming homeless when our rights, I mean, when our rents are, aren't paid, they are quick to contact us? There are individuals that live in these units that have retired, disabled, and sick that know that now may have to go back into the job market to try and find units where they can afford to pay rent on. Is this the county or North Las Vegas selling their units also, or is it just the city? Thank you so much. If you hang tight, uh, we can take a look at the communications that you have. Uh, we can see what's in contracts. But again, at this point, we will not go back and forward. But if you like to sit around after the meeting, you can get some of those questions answered. And I may have to like exit because I do have another meeting. To if you to. can leave your contact information, that would be very helpful. I sure. Who do I leave, whom do I leave it with? We can, uh, brother friend. We, oh, actually, someone will get it right here. Thank you so much again, and we'll get your some some of those questions answered. Is there anyone else uh, wishing to come forward for the second portion of the citizens' participation period? Hearing and seeing none. This meeting is adjourned.